Stephanie's talk earlier, but I thought this mm-hmm. would be like a good museum shirt. I saw like the flashes of like the greens, the blues, and the purples. I was trying to get like a close up of what your what your pattern is. But yeah, this is like one of the last awesome. times I ever went shopping was when I bought this <laughs> shirt. It was like I think it was on the Thursday, the last Thursday we worked in the building. Like somebody texted me a picture of it, and then I worked with Kristen to figure out what store it was yeah. from. And then I went to the store and I bought this shirt. It was a great day. That's awesome. <laughs> I love wearing themed shirts. You have some good ones. Today is just a regular pink and white sweater, but. Yeah, I saw a really good bat sweater. There was somebody who came to the science hub who's apparently also a carnivore keeper at Brookfield. Um, But yeah, had a really good bat sweater on, which is why I was like, hello, I extra want to talk to you. It's like when kids wear good animal shirts too. I'm like, let's talk. You want to talk about sharks? It looks like you want to talk about sharks today. So. And the kid, little kiddo clothes always have like the coolest patterns too, especially for like natural history themed things. Like, can't you make that in adult sizes? <laughs> it's like it's such a pain to my existence when there's like only kid sizes of like really good stuff. Yeah. One of my friends has very, very small feet and uh, there's like toddler shoes that are really good dinosaur pattern. I like sent them to I'm like maybe you can wear this because like she is like lives in those very small sizes so I don't know maybe hopes and that's dreams. awesome someday maybe yeah <laughs> all right I think we are ready to get started Anna are you ready I'm so ready awesome all right hi everyone my name is Lauren Wagner I use she her pronouns I'm the Learning Operations Coordinator here at the Field Museum, and I'm here today with Anna, my coworker in the Learning Center. Anna, do you want to talk a little bit about yourself before we dive more deep into questions? Sure. Hello, I am Anna. My pronouns are they, them, and I also work at the Field Museum. I am a educator. My title has a lot of words in it. It's Gallery Learning Experience Coordinator, but that pretty much means is I develop and facilitate hands-on learning experiences, or Learning experience is formerly known as hands-on, but in this time period, we've been finding different avenues to make them engaging, but no hands allowed. Not today. Anna, can you tell us a little bit more about your role at the Field Museum or what your average day-to-day looked like? Yeah, so what I do is I mostly work in a particular room called the Granger Science Hub. I can share, I'll share my screen and show a picture of what that kind of looks like. Um, But there's an exhibit space which has cool stuff in it. And sometimes that stuff is specimens from our collection. Sometimes it is replicas. Um, Sometimes we get some really high quality printouts. You can see that giant picture of a frog. Um, But so pretty much I bring out specimens and I talk to people about the work that happens in the museum or different animals and the different things we're learning about them, like all sorts of different stuff. Science is such a big category. Um, And the room is called the Science Hub. And some of it arguably is like not necessarily science, but it's like all all knowledge, all information sharing. So this is um, kind of a picture of me at work, but it's not always me with a jar with a mud puppy in it. It can be, a, it can look like a lot of different things. And so sometimes I'm on the floor with people. Sometimes I am doing the research and making the connections with our scientists to find those materials or to find more information. And I also work with volunteers. Um, We haven't had volunteers in the building for a while. So like that scene is not something that can happen today, but before that was what I did. And I did a lot of research and like coordination with our volunteers and development of the activities that our volunteers would do as well. How uh, much of a transitional change has it been from being home to being in the hub all the time? It's been a lot. So the work has shifted a great deal as you are all watching this on a screen right now, we've been doing a lot more virtual programs. And some of those have been similar to things we did in person. For example, we do, um, we're doing this right now, which is kind of similar to a program we do on Facebook that was called Meet a Scientist. And we used to do a Meet a Scientist program in the building as well. Um, So some stuff is kind of similar, but just like on a screen instead of in person. has been completely new. We did a summer camp for the first time ever, the Field Museum's own summer camp, um, and that was all virtual this year. So 
it's varied a lot. And then now that the building is reopened, we're still in that exhibit space that we saw the picture of, but now I have a glass enclosure like a zoo animal and we still use really cool specimens like that, but there is that barrier. Um, but we're still finding ways to engage with people. So sometimes we have a lot of frogs and like descriptions of their calls. We can play their calls and people can try to match them or we like have different thought provoking questions and like try to look at evidence to explore whether or not bats are blind. Um, they're not blind, spoiler alert. I don't have all my eyeballs to look at, but just so you know, bats are not blind. One of our audience would like to know, how do you translate science that's happening to easily understand, understand for the public? And can you give us an example of how you turn science ideas into an activity? Yeah. So I think one of the most important things, a lot of the science that's happening in the museum is like really deeply specific about something. And it's about a lot of different things because there's so many different people working so one example is we did an exhibit about rats in the Philippines. Um, there's a lot of different types of rats in the Philippines, but we just like made that an, like a more contextualized sense of like, okay, let's talk about where animals live. So in the United States, all the states are connected and we were having people put little pins into this map of where they had seen, you know, a gray squirrel or a black squirrel or a deer and, um, some other animals too but we were kind of like building that map of where those animals live and like using your own experiences and observations to connect that to these like places that people have never been these animals that people have never seen um so a lot of it is like trying to build that relevancy the philippines is a bunch of islands and having all those like separated locations mm -hmm. it's a lot of different species than you see here so some of the like fun unique animals in the united states are more localized, like on the Keys, where we have some of those islands, there's like the key deer, which are much smaller and different than the white-tailed deer around here. Mm -hmm. It's like one example. Um, and then your other question of like how you turn a science idea into an activity, we really try to hit a lot of different modes of engagement, um, which has been a lot of challenges in COVID era. But one of the things I really liked is we've, we did one about like deep sea exploration. And so instead of just talking about what that's like, we you know had this little environment that we built out of different materials uh, that was like um, the hydrothermal vents in the bottom of the sea. And we filled it with plastic deep sea animals. And then we talk about the submersible named Alvin who has like a little grabby claw to pick up those specimens. But then we give people a grabby claw so they too can try to grab those specimens and like, talk about the different variables of the limited time and limited mobility but yeah so it's trying to make things as like hands-on and like a real imaginative experience as possible i would love it if we could send people down into alvin but it would take a long time mm -hmm. it's particularly difficult i've also never been in a submersible so we have a question here from vito martinez middle school they'd like to know which current or upcoming exhibit did you think would be the hardest to develop a hands-on experience and why was that challenging? That's a really good question. So I think for my own brain, everything feels easier after you've already done it, right? So for me right now, what seems the most challenging is anything that we haven't done yet. And one exhibit we've been talking about for a long time is about the Java Sea shipwreck. And that's a small part of the China Hall. Um, and so we would have objects from that shipwreck put in our exhibit and talk about that. And I think not only is it challenging because it's like not yet been thought fully out by me and my team. And um, that's another thing too, everything we do is like collaborative. So I work with a team of people. Most people, most great discoveries and things do not happen from like literally one person working in a vacuum. Everything is collaborative, which is really cool. Um, but because it's also a literal one shipwreck, it'll be difficult to not have some of the same replica access we have with other topics. Like when we had an exhibit about footprints, you can buy really good fossil footprint replicas, but this is like one specific shipwreck with like some really cool, but really specific archeological objects they like don't make replicas of because most people do not want this like 
metal bar that you would use in a scale to like weigh goods and decide how much value they have. And we also don't have exact or like similar objects in the museum. So right now we have an exhibit about conservation in Chicago and in the Andes Amazon. And we have a lot of bugs, a lot of bugs from Chicago. So it's like, cool, this exhibit has some stuff behind glass over there, but we can also get a bunch of Chicago insects and bring them closer to people so they can get like right on top of the specimens. And historically, they used to be able to touch a lot of specimens. Um, but for that one, we like all the objects in the collection are much more one of a kind. So we won't have the same access to like replicas or the real thing. So those are some of the challenges with that one. We will see. Can you talk a little bit about what other jobs you've had in the past and how it impacted or influenced you to where you are today? Yeah, I love talking about my jobs. So I work today as a museum educator and I really started out doing that a long time ago. When I was in high school as a senior, the first job related thing I did after I graduated was I like did a volunteer internship at the local children's museum. And pretty much every summer after that, I was doing some type of internship and most of them were in museums. So it's been like an interesting journey because I started out doing education the next summer, I was doing more design work um, at the t and I switched my major in college a lot too. You don't need to know what your plan is. You can figure it out later. Um, so I was doing like art and design for like signage, but also we were like catching bugs and then putting the bugs in resin. That was a really fun job too. There's a lot of weird stuff. Museums have like a lot of weird tasks and that was one of the things I always liked about it. And then another summer I was doing animal care and taking care of animals in a science center. Um, because I needed more animal experience because you always need more animal experience to do even more animal experience. And I've, I have always really liked animals. So then the next summer I did field work and like research in Peru. And that I actually, I have pictures starting from there so I can share my screen again. Boo, 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 boo. So that was an interesting time. Um, but doing field work, because at the times like you have to do field work to have the experience to do more field work. If you wanna do animal research, you need to like start building up that experience. I was like, okay, cool. I will do this and then I will have this experience. And part of the reason it's really good to try things is figure out whether or not you like it. I like, I like field work okay, but it was also kind of stressful. <laughs> and I don't feel very, I, I liked aspects of it, but I could tell that this was not gonna be like the fulfilling forever home for me. Um, so for an idea of what that field work was like, there's that little picture in the corner of these very cute monkeys. Um, they're wearing what looks like poly beads. They pretty much are those like poly plastic beads. Um, and those are their identification. So we're part of this big research project where they will capture these animals temporarily. They put those collars on them. The one on the very far side has like kind of a white lump. That lump is connected to an antenna. And so that's the one that we can track. So in the picture, me with the long hair there has this apparatus which can unfold, looks like a Christmas tree. And then you have to spin this Christmas tree like stick. It's a radio telemeter and you have to spin that in a circle and like find where it's beeping the most to figure out where that radio transmitter monkey is. And then you follow those monkeys all day. But if you ever lose track of them, which you can do very easily because they're very tiny and they're running around high up in the trees, um, then you have to tell them it for them again. And it's kind of hard to find space where you can spin around in the rainforest. So it was a it was a really cool experience, but it's very hard. And it's really hard when you're like getting stressed out about finding animal poop. So animal poop is actually full of information. So like one of the most important things you're trying to do is like collect these monkeys poop. Because if we get their poop, it's full of DNA and hormones and all this stuff. And like I was having stress dreams about like finding monkey poop because you can see sometimes like, okay, like it's there. It's like raising its tail, it's gonna happen. And then you have to find it. It's so hard to find sometimes. So anyways, it was a really great experience. I met really great people, but I'm like, this is a lot of stress to find monkey poop. And I don't know if I like, I'm gonna get better at finding monkey poop. So I don't know. The other thing too, is I thought it was so cool that all this stuff happens, but so many people don't know about all the work that goes into understanding things about animals. And I really love education work. So after I did this, oh, and there's also like the technical stuff. So you like sit on the computer and enter data 
and like they only run the generator for like a few hours at night. That was pretty chill. It was a really fun time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, field work is an adventure. But I was like, I really would rather do things where I have more educational outlets because I want to be able to talk to people. After I did this, I like made a poster and I presented it. And I was, I really liked talking about it more than I liked actually doing it. So I wanted to find ways I could combine that. And a good way to combine, if you like working with animals and working with people, they have zoos for that. So as soon as I finished school, I was working in Disney's Animal Kingdom as a research intern. This is a gorilla. Um, his name is Corey. He's very cute. He was one year old um, when I took this picture. And we did a lot of behavioral observations on the animals in the park. Um, they do also still use animal poop a lot in zoos. And it's great because it's way easier to find. Also as a fun fact, which you probably definitely should know, is that if you have, let's say, two cheetahs that live in the same habitat, how do you know whose poop is poop if you're not watching them all the time? Well, you make sure you feed them separately and you have some of them eat food safe glitter and then the glittery poop belongs to this one and not the other one. And there's like different colors of food safe glitter. So it's like a lot of fun tricks you don't think about was used. But anyways, I loved doing this work, but even doing this work, I did some research on like observing the animals, but while I'm observing the animals, I'm also answering people's questions. We also had really fun experiences called magical moments. And like periodically you needed to do a magical moment because it's Disney World. And so we would like bring people into the lab and have them play games, really fun games, like match the feces with this species. Like the poop never gets old. But this and like we would give people things like this, like this is a piece of giraffe poop glued to a pencil that I still have. So they have like a nice keepsake of all the fun things they learned on their family vacation that they did not realize was gonna be this educational. So I loved all that stuff, but like the education part was my very favorite. When this internship was over, um, I was talking to the people that I worked with there, the different managers, and they wanted to know what my career goals were. And I was like, I really like education interpretation, like really clicks for me. And they recommended I look at the Orlando Science Center because they were hiring. Oh, I'm like talking too fast. I like need to breathe again. But um, so I started working at the Orlando Science Center and I got a job there. And that was a really fun time. There were less animals, which was a little sad for me, but it was a lot of fun. So we did like big stage shows about electricity, which we see here, but we also had like the science of combustion and the eclipse, a lot of solar system stuff, but also dinosaurs, sometimes a little bit of animals, but not a ton of animals. Um, but it was a really fun time. And also I know somebody asked about this T-Rex behind me. Um, I made that while I worked there. It was with solar ovens. So I like cut up a bunch of crayons and I melted them in solar ovens and made this thing. It was very fun. And I like made the pattern based off of Sue because I've always been a really big Sue fan because um, Sue's really awesome. So I love working in museums. I love just the variety of different stuff you can work on. You're always learning new things, always talking to fun people. It was a great time. And then I saw this job posting at the Field Museum and I was like, oh, ho, ho. an education job at the Field Museum? How magical. Like that's closer to my family who's from Indiana. It's like, got my animals again. And it it's nice because the Field Museum is like a place where real research happens. And I had started out doing real research. Um, not that there's fake research. I don't know what I mean by that. But like the actual data collection is happening in the Field Museum and the preserving of specimens and the sharing of specimens to gain knowledge is all happening right here. And then also the education is happening right here. A lot of the times those are in separate places like the field work was not great for me because I wanted the education to also be closer to it. And then in the Science Center, it was all education, but there was no research, whatever, which is fine. Um, and that's true for a lot of like science type museums, like the Museum of Science and Industry. Very fun, but they're not like actually studying weather or tornadoes or coal mines or something. But yeah, so that was a really long ramble about stuff that I've done. <laughs> No problem. Can you give us a little bit of advice that you would share with middle or high school students that are interested in the same career path that you have? Yeah, um, if you're interested in the same type of stuff, I recommend finding places that have the things that are exciting to you and trying to volunteer there or intern if that like opens up in whatever age bracket that exists at. Um, I highly, highly recommend it because it's it's so nice to just test drive jobs as a volunteer or an intern, just get started doing that work at the places you think are fun. 
So you kind of covered this question a little bit with talking about your work in Peru, but what challenges have you faced in your career? Oh my gosh, Peru is the hardest like work I've ever done by a lot in like a logistical sense. Um, but there's other challenges too. So even like right now, figuring out how to do hand, like how to have something engaging, especially for young children that are really looking for a more sensorily immersive experience in the museum. It's hard because the play lab is closed. We're there, but like behind glass and it's hard to hear us. So definitely this time is really challenging. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of it is always still like talking about the challenges and recognizing that other people are there with you and like will either help you or just help you feel like seen because a lot of the struggles during this shared so other museums are experiencing the same struggles and sharing their resources my other coworkers are experiencing the same struggles and sharing our resources so it's it's an adventure are there any skills that you learned in middle or high school that you use today um there's probably a handful of skills that i had in middle and high school what should i even do in middle school so long ago I think the first time I dissected an owl pellet was probably in middle school. And I still really like owl pellets. I think I like them even more now than I did then, which is really fun. I'm deeply a fan of owl pellets, which is, it's never, it's always good to like owl pellets. <laughs> so our next question comes from Nettle Horse, sixth grade class. They'd like to know what sparked your passion? to go into this kind of work? That's a great question. So I really have always liked museums. As a child, I went to the Indianapolis Children's Museum a lot, which is a great museum. If you're ever in Indiana, I highly, highly, highly recommend you go there. Um, it's delightful. And that was the first place that I interned right out of high school. So I like, yeah, I just really liked that experience as a, as a guest. And then I just wanted to be a part of it as like, the facilitator of those experiences. This next question also comes from an L horse sixth grade class. They'd like to know, and I really like this question. What was one of the <laughs> scariest, strangest, weirdest things that's ever happened to you in a museum? And are you superstitious? Okay, so in the field museum, I was working an evening event. I don't remember, it was like some business having a nighttime -y hangout party thing in the museum. And I was walking through the taxidermy halls and for some reason on like the automatic timer settings, all the lights turned off. And so it's like total darkness and like by lions and antelopes and cheetahs and all these people are there that are like not as familiar with the space. So that was, I wasn't like, ter it was weird. I wasn't like scared. I was honestly like very excited. I was pretty thrilled. I was like, wow, this is so epic anything could happen. But then also because I am trying, I want to be a helpful resource to people. I'm like, okay, this isn't just fun and games. I have to make sure that people feel okay. So I like turned on my flashlight and let people know like that I was there and where things were. And then the lights came back on and it was fine. But there's a lot of superstitions around the museum, um, which I am sure you're not surprised by. One of my favorites is there was a raccoon's footprints on this dusty wall for a really long time. And I believe they've been dusted off now, tragically, but it is this great mystery of this ghostly raccoon. So that was one of my favorites. I remember from our audience would like to know, is there anyone who has been particularly influential or supportive in your career path? That's a great question. Um, I feel I've been very fortunate with a lot of like peer to peer support. Any place I've ever worked, I still have friends there. There's people I worked with in Florida that like still work with animals that I like visited in Hawaii because like my friend Sadie now does whale watching tours and so I'm like jumping on her boat and I'm still very in touch with my friends in Orlando we like send each other like cool ideas and things that are happening in museums um and also my parents I'm very grateful for my parents they've always like supported me so that's always something I appreciate So we're gonna segue now to your artwork in the background. So we have a lot of fans that love your artwork. So you mentioned a little bit about the crayons that you use to make the Sioux. Can you talk a little bit about your snowflakes and how you yeah. make those? Yeah, so 
Um, all those like little wooden circle-y things, those are based off of paper snowflakes. Um, so I really like animals, as I've said before. And so one of the many ways I engage with my love of animals is making paper snowflakes that look like animals. And so pretty much like any oops, species could become a snowflake. So that one was a frog, this one is a flamingo. Um, and I know somebody asked too about um, patterns and I believe we'll be able to email you some of the like printable PDFs of how to cut these. Um, so you can have some fun with that. But yeah, I've been making animal snowflakes for like years in paper and then also because of museums and museum maker spaces. Um, I learned a lot about laser cutting and I really liked that and I bought a laser cutter. So I like laser cut these wooden ornaments just as like another fun side hustly hobby thing. What is your favorite snowflake that you've made? I see you have a ton of different ones back there. I do. So I'm gonna, I don't know where my paper one is, but I have a wooden one for a gerboa. A gerboa popping um, rodent. If you wanna learn about a new animal, I recommend you look up the gerboa. It starts with a J and they're just really cute. I really like gerboas. They make me really happy because they're just like a little silly popping mouse. And I love that. What interested you in making these snowflakes? Do you have a love for science and art? I do. I do love science and art. And actually, before I did animals, I did a lot of names. So I can make snowflakes with people's names, too. So I did that for, like, everybody in our department. I started doing that in college, too. I did that for, like, everyone in my freshman dorm. <laughs> do you make any other types of art besides the snowflakes? I make all the art. Um, so I also made this jerboa recently. I've been doing extra art during like the quarantine times because I don't go anywhere else. Um, so this is another jerboa and that's done with needle felting. Um, my cat is like sitting next to a pillow. I also painted that chair, but it's like maybe a little sunny, but I really like this pillow and then my cat is sleeping there. But yeah, I just make a lot of stuff. Have you found that your science background influences your art background and vice versa? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it definitely the subject matter has a lot of overlap. So when I learn about a new animal um, and like a living or extinct, to be clear, because in the Field Museum, we do have a lot of dinosaurs and other fossils. Um, I'm always excited to like engage with that in new ways and like make it into other stuff. So somewhere I have a Tully monster of some sort that like is a sticker. I don't know what I stuck it to though, but yeah, they're fun. <laughs> so it sounds like you're following your passion for animals and art to make cool things. Do you think that this might grow into a bigger part of your career in the future? I, I would like that a lot. Actually, when I left the Orlando Science Center and to move, take this job, I was like leading a makerspace development. They were building a new makerspace. I left before it opened, but I was very involved in the development. And I would really love, if the, I love everything at the Field Museum, but I also really like makerspace. And like, can you just put a makerspace in the Field Museum and then put me in it? That would be cool. Um, so I would really like to continue finding ways to like combine the work that I'm doing with a lot of art um, in the museum or outside the museum. Because I've also been doing like just snowflake cutting workshops for libraries like on the weekends on Zoom now that the internet makes a lot of virtual events really easy. There's a lot of ways to engage. So it's been really fun. Thanks, Anna. And thanks for sharing all of the information about yourself and your career and your artwork. And thank you yeah. all for tuning in and watching our talk today. Stay tuned for more information for next month's career chats. Have a safe